Welcome everyone. Uh, and I'm happy to see you live uh, in the last session, but not the least uh, for uh, of the day one of the Digital Container Summit 2022. Um, and today, Brian Glick, um, the founder and CEO of Chain.io, um, will talk about optimization of container operations uh, with digitalization. I hope you enjoyed the event so far and you could schedule some one-on-one -on -one meetings today. Um, you can still schedule more meetings after this session until the end of your day and uh, of course tomorrow. Uh, don't forget that most active attendees will be announced and receive a DCS award tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central European time. Now, uh, I would like to introduce to you the speaker of this session, uh, Brian Glick. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Chain.io. Uh, he has made a career of simplifying complex supply chain and train compliance IT challenges, uh, whether analyzing complex coding issues or rationalizing the compliance impacts of a vendor direct dropship program. Uh, Brian brings a rare combination of executive perspective and deep technology technical knowledge to today's supply chain challenges. Uh, from the early days of web-based visibility platforms and into today's connected active systems, Brian has been an active leader in each phase of the connected supply chain revolution. And I'm giving the word to you, Brian. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone for both everyone who presented in all the sessions earlier today, as well as uh, staying till the end here. Uh, to listen to me go on for a little bit. So um, again, what we want to talk about today is digital transformation uh, and the words around it and where we are and where we can go as as a group, as, a, as an industry together. Uh, so a little bit just to, to expand on my background slightly, uh, my first digitization or digitalization, and we'll get into the, those two topics, um, um, experience was actually my first day in the industry when I was a, uh, a kid put in front of a scanner so that we could scan customs paperwork in Philadelphia and start sending it back to our European customers as PDFs uh, instead of sending back boxes and boxes of paper. Uh, so we've come a long way since then uh, in, in those 23 years. Uh, and, and we certainly feel that we have a long way to go as an industry. But uh, before I ever start a talk like this, I'd like to just point out that we make incredible progress in this industry and uh, we do it every day and we continue to do it. And we are we really do an amazing job. And I think sometimes we don't give ourselves quite enough credit for that. Uh, so let's let's dive in. We'll talk a little bit about what the transformation is. Uh, where we are and what can get in our way and how we get around those blockers. Uh, so to start, let's talk about a couple of words here. Uh, digitization, digitalization, digital progression, digital transformation. There are all these words where that people use to describe making progress. Uh, they don't really matter, but people get hung up on them for a minute. So uh, the two that are the most popular, which I'm not going to use a lot in this presentation if I can avoid it because I trip over them, are digitization and digitalization. And the general consensus, though I was just at a conference a few weeks ago where I think every speaker was using these words differently, is that digitization is the capturing of the information digitally. So how do we get uh, a paper bill of lading to be an electronic bill of lading? And digitalization is the improvement of the process, the actual transformation of what you do to be different. So in that example of capturing those paper documents and, and turning them into PDFs and then eventually turning those into EDI files, that's all that first class. We're just taking something, making it more efficient. And so if we follow the progression uh, on this slide, taking a paper process, turning it into an email process, that's a step forward that's not really transforming your business process. You're still exchanging the same information the same way. You're still issuing that delivery order. You're just not sending it on the fax machine. It's now in your outlook. Uh, and then the next step is, is data exchange, is saying, we're going to do the exact same business process, but instead of sending you an email, I'm going to send an EDI file or, or a, an API call, or it doesn't matter what technology. We're doing the exact same thing we did yesterday 
We're just doing it a little bit faster and a little bit more efficiently. And that's really good. That's important. But there's, there's that next level, which is transformation, which is being able to answer a, a, a bigger call from the customer to do something that couldn't be done before, to create something entirely new. Uh, so as an example, and I, I chose to pick on, on Tive today, uh, the progression is container visibility, is instead of tracking the ship, uh, I'm going to track the actual container and I'm going to get additional visibility, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to load that right back into my TMS. And we're going to do the same thing we did yesterday, just with more granularity. Transformation is when we think about how do we use that information to absolutely change a business process, to do something that couldn't be done before. So um, imagine an example where you have a, a BCO who comes to you and they have 10 containers. And all of those 10 containers need to get from Ningbo to Houston, Texas. And instead of asking them how they want them routed or uh, even considering moving them as 10 containers, we're able to use this tracking information, pair it with capacity information, uh, port congestion information, uh, trucking rates, all of this information and think of it as uh, like we think of the internet where you don't really know how your data moves around. We don't know how this image is getting from my desk through all the different routes to all of your screens. Uh, but instead we're able to use all that information to sell a service to the shipper that says, I know what product you have in those containers. I know when you need it in the store. I have all of your demand signals and my job is to get it positioned for you in the store on time. And so we're going to actually balance risk and rates and be able to route and reroute dynamically those 10 containers on 10 individual journeys that might take different paths. And some of them might move east and some might move west and some may go through the Panama Canal and some may go on the rail. And we're going to be able to do that because instead of having one person tracking in the TMS these dates over and over again, we're able to let the computers do something entirely new in the world. And that's really when I think about transformation, the key is that you can bring new services, that you're doing something that is higher margin oftentimes, but more importantly, closer to the consumer. Uh, and, and this is something that I think as we think about container freight and we think about uh, allocating containers and, and moving empties around and all of these important things and buying and selling containers, we often can be disconnected from the fact that ultimately we all work for the consumer, that we may be positioning an empty so that it can be filled with screws for someone who's shipping them to a wind turbine company who's using that to power a wind farm, to power electric trucks, to deliver e-commerce toothbrushes to a consumer. But ultimately, we're all doing that in the benefit of the consumer and where we can move our value as service providers closer to the consumer is where we really get to see transformation. So how can we use this information to make sure that that critical shipment of product that has to be on the shelves doesn't end up at the bottom of a stack where it can't get out of the port? Or how can we make sure that we know the demand signals of our customers so that we can be buying and selling containers on the market so that we always have capacity where they're going to need it, even if they haven't contacted us yet. So it's that, that connection that lets us think backwards from the consumer experience is very much where we see the opportunity and transformation. Now, the progression, the things on the, on the uh, where we are side of the slide, these are also important and they're foundational. And that's a lot of what we're doing today. Right, so in order to do all of those amazing things and you know, be the man on Mars, we have to start by eliminating these paper processes, using the tools and the software that's out there today and becoming more efficient and increasing all of this visibility, getting this data into the place where we can use it um, with people today and eventually use it in machine learning and artificial intelligence to make these better decisions. So the work we're doing today very much uh, to steal the Amazon phrase is day zero work for day one, which is all of this future transformation that could happen. So 
what are some of the roadblocks? What are some of the things that are getting in our way today? Uh, pick three here. There's, there's a million. There always is. Uh, language and technology and inertia. Uh, and we'll go through each one of these. Uh, the first one is probably the most important. And when, when we talk about language, we as an industry aren't always great in agreeing what the words mean. Uh, and when we don't know what we're talking about, it is very hard to innovate on it. And one of the things that we see in our work at Chain.io is that most of the value that we are able to create in people's digital transformation journeys comes from getting them to understand what they do and across globally distributed companies, use, start using the same words to describe the same processes. And that can be very, very challenging. Um, there's a quote here from, from Thomas from the DCSA about the, the, the lack of adoption in standards. But the thing that the DCSA has done, and, and uh, those of you who may have heard me speak at other conferences, I try to bring this up every time, is they've created a blueprint, a way to talk about the language of container shipping in a way that is common that has nothing to do with the tech. And starting to adopt that and look at the way we're talking and making sure we're all talking about the same thing is extremely important. And there's a very specific example that came up recently uh, that Eric, who spoke earlier, wrote about in the Journal of Commerce here in the US around our Ocean Shipping Reform Act and its impact on detention and demurrage. And one of the data elements that the uh, our Federal Maritime Commission is requiring is container availability date. And it's really the most important date to be able to say, you know, when was this available and when should, you know, when was free time starting and so on and so forth. And there's no agreement as to what those words in our law mean. There's no such thing as container availability date and yet it's embedded in our new law. Uh, and that's a problem. And coming together as an industry and fixing this and really adopting a common set of words to describe what we do is, is step one and is one of our biggest roadblocks. Um, step two is accepting technical debt. And you know we have a lot of modern forward thinking people uh, presenting uh, this week, and we all have to accept that there are still people in the world who are using these old monitors. Uh, there are still people in the world who are running 40 year old ERPs. They're you know, operating major parcel companies today. Um, and none of what we're doing as innovation works unless we also acknowledge that there is a technical debt challenge, that there is the history of our industry and we don't just get to launch forward. And this is the only slide where I put my company's logo, but this is our mission, uh, is to help companies that have been working with old technology in bring in new technology or work with partners who are on newer technology or older. Uh, you know, as an example, we have a, a customer who's a, a uh, purchase order management platform and they signed two new customers this week and they're very modern. Everything's API driven. And both customers said, well, the only way we can work with you is to send you EDI or you can wait a year or two uh, for us to try to catch up to you. And that's the reality. And it's part of innovation is understanding that innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum and it has to happen from the baseline of where your company is and where your partners are. Uh, and, and the third roadblock is always people. Um, I love people. People are why I do what I do. Uh, you know, every day we think about how all this tech can help make somebody's job at the desk level easier. Uh, but we have to consider it when we're considering innovation and transformation and consider the drivers who are picking things up and consider their willingness and ability to change and what they may be afraid of that comes with the change and with automation uh, and consider the people who are booking the cargo and, and so on. Uh, and I have an example of a customer of ours who was trying to implement a uh, pricing engine and the project was uh, was not successful. And the, the primary reason for the failure was they had an office in Southern Europe that was very, very comfortable quoting every piece of freight very specifically to their customers. And they did it with phone calls and they did it with emails uh, and it worked for them. And the headquarters, which was in, in Southeast Asia, um, basically said, oh, no, no, we're just going to put in all this new tech. We love technology. This is our culture and we're doing all of these things. 
and the project died when it came to Southern Europe because they hadn't done the groundwork. They hadn't understood that, yes, there was the ability to implement technology, but they needed to work with the people and explain the why and not just say, hey, there's new tech and assume everyone's going to love it. Uh, and this can be dangerous for those of us who, who come to conferences like this because we all love tech and we love seeing all of these new innovative ways that we can work, but not everyone comes from that same place. And considering culture in your transformation is extremely important. Uh, so what do we do going forward? How do we take all of those roadblocks and actually make things happen? Uh, so the first is we have to innovate. Um, and standardization is a big topic. I talked about it with the words and agreeing on the language, uh, but it's also not an excuse. The absence of standards or the fact that we have too many standards is a big topic in our industry. It's uh, I've seen entire conferences just on that topic. And the fact that we don't know what we're talking about all the time or that we don't agree all the time or that we can't pick a technology is not an excuse to stop innovating. It is a thing we need to acknowledge and then keep pushing in front of. Uh, one of the questions that I've been asked a lot around standards is actually in the e-commerce delivery space and uh, why, why standards may look different there, why they may not exist yet. Uh, and the thing with standards is you standardize things that are already uh, finished, things that are static, things that have been completed. So standardizing the message to uh, you know, to make a booking, that is a very well-established process where there is not a ton of innovation going on in the concept of booking. But where we have these new things like like uh, commodity markets that are being created or industry or the ability to trade things that couldn't have been traded before, we're, you don't necessarily want standards there. You want to innovate and the standards really freeze everyone in a moment in time. Uh, so as innovators, as transformation companies, uh, or as people consuming this transformation, don't wait for the standards. Do the hard work because that's what's going to make you differentiated from your competitors. And waiting for the standards is going to going to freeze you in time. Uh, the second is to make it work. Uh, practice and success is what will make those standards. It's what makes things boring in the future. Is to be innovative now, uh, and meeting your customers and your partners where they are. Uh, we all work in diff with different ports who are in very different levels of technology. We work with different truckers who are at different levels of technology. And we need to meet them where they are, use these innovative tools in our practice, and then sometimes simplify them a little bit for what goes out, right? So using all of this analytics and then still sending a paper document is okay if that's what gets you where you need to be. Uh, there's uh, an expression that a, a boss of mine used to love, which is perfect is the enemy of good. And we are never going to have perfect innovation in an industry where tens of thousands of individual companies have to collaborate to make this supply chain work. So you have to be very, very pragmatic and understand that you can innovate internally and often put some pressure externally, but you have to adapt to the world around you. And many innovations will die at the point where you try to expose them to the rest of the world if you're not willing to get a little messy and get a little ugly with how it interacts with all of your trading partners and with all of your external participants. Uh, and last and, and probably most importantly, uh, we have to go forward together. Uh, this is not an industry where we get to all sit in, in, our, in our private offices and not talk to each other. Um, competitors work together. Uh, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with a, a venture capitalist who uh, is not from our industry, but was investing in quite a number of companies that are uh, focusing on sustainability, on environmental, on labor issues, on social governance, on all of these, these very important topics. Uh, and, and he asked me about whether innovation and collaboration in our industry needed a closed network, sort of the Apple model of a walled garden uh, where everyone came in and did the work in a very controlled way, or an open network, uh, something more like Windows or Android, where it is uh, a bit messier and everyone is free to participate and innovate. And 
I actually struggled with the question at first because our industry is so open in general. There is such a wide range of cultures and people and companies, and we all have to work together even when we're competing, that the idea of a closed network didn't even, I couldn't even conceptualize it in our business. And when we think about transformation innovation, we have to think about it in our companies, but also in how it works with all of our competitors and with all of these things that have to work together in order for us to create open innovation. And so uh, that's really what I want you to leave, want to leave you all with. And I'll, we obviously have some time for questions, but this idea that when you think about transformation, don't just think about yourself, don't just think about your department, don't just think about your company, don't just think about your company and your customers, but also your competitors. And also the fact that if we create a better innovation space for all of us to collaborate, understanding all of these different challenges we have, all of the inertia that's in our existing companies, all of the technical debt, that together, we put all of that together, we do amazing things. Overnight shipping should not be a possibility. If you told somebody 100 years ago that you could send a package overnight across the world, that's the, that we did that as an industry, that's conceptually, they would just, they would laugh at you. Um, we have the ability to do these amazing things when we do them together. And that's really the message I want to leave you with. So, so thank you all very much for uh, sticking around to the end of the day for that. Uh, do we have any questions? Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, no, so far we oh, don't yeah. have any questions. Um, if you have any questions, you can still um, write them in the chat or in the Q&A tab um, above your chat. Um, and we will wait a couple of more seconds for any coming questions. Thank you very much, Brian, for your very interesting speech. Thank you. I'm just waiting a couple of more seconds. No, I guess um, we don't have any questions more. Um, so thank you very much for uh, your attention today. Um, feel free to follow Brian on LinkedIn. I have posted his link uh, in the chat. Um, if you have more questions, you can ask him uh, directly after the session. And um, once again, I hope you really enjoyed um, the event so far and you could schedule some one-on-one -on -one meetings today. I uh, could take this opportunity to meet new business partners. Um, I want to remind you that you can still schedule more meetings after this session uh, and, of course, tomorrow. Um, don't forget that the most active attendees will be rewarded uh, tomorrow during the DCS Awards. Um, as well, tomorrow we have prepared more interesting sessions for you. Uh, please join us at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Central European time for uh, the session Piecing Together Container Leasing. Um, and um, we will be happy uh, to see you again tomorrow. Thank you uh, for the day. And um, I think we will finish. <laughs>